Okay, Christ our healer, part 3b, and we're going to dig a little bit <laughs> deeper. In fact, we're going to study some Hebrew, what the Hebrew language, you remember in the discovery series that we did some time ago, some of you, um, we looked into some of the Hebrew words and we're going to do that tonight too. But let's try and answer the question, what really happened on the cross? The most game-changing, dramatic moment in human history it's worth exploring some of those things. And we're going to explore it through the lens of the Old Testament, um, giving us types and shadows and pictures of what happened on the cross through, in this case, um, Moses. But just as, a, as an introduction to this session, the big picture context of God's plan for man and purpose for man was that creation was all good. You've heard of the expression, it's all good, it's all good. Well, that was the only time where everything was all good. Since that time, we've had some problems. We live on a fallen earth. The earth itself has yet to be redeemed. Yes, Jesus has been to the cross. He's paved the way and he's opened the door for our forgiveness and healing ultimately. But there is an unfolding of God's restoration plan that's taking place at this time where the earth itself will be redeemed. Things like germs and disease and vermin and uh, plagues will have been dealt with at that time. Ultimately, with a new heaven, a new earth, and in fact, all of us, people that have died, will receive a resurrected body that is decomposed and dust to dust and all that sort of stuff. And then those that get caught up when at the second coming... Uh, uh, will receive a, a, a resurrected body and everything will be radically different to the way it is now but there is a restoration process involved at this time we're going to get uh, in the future uh, uh, as as some people put it an extreme makeover so if you don't like your nose or your ears or your knees or your big toe you're going to get a makeover and you're going to be just Perfect. Everything is going to be just wonderful. All that hair will have come back. And you can style it whichever way you want. Maybe. I don't know. Probably. Something like that. Yes. Yeah. Do you think I'll have hairdressers in heaven? No. I mean, we won't need one. We'll just speak to our hair and say, be nice. <laughs> be in place. No bad the hair days. Okay. Moving right along here. Look through the lens now of Moses and the bronze serpent incident. I don't know whether you're familiar with this from Numbers chapter 21 verses 4 through to 9. So why don't we dive in there, read through the whole passage and then unpack some of the things that are significant here in terms of healing through the lens of what happened under Moses' ministry that point towards Jesus on the cross. Wow, it's fascinating. Verse 4. Then they, that's the Israelites with Moses as a leader, journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. It took some time. Very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Oh my goodness. You know, why is this taking so long? What, what's the problem? Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food and water. So they're starting to exaggerate now because they got food and water every day. And our soul, this is more closer to the, to the truth now, loathes this worthless bread. Now what bread are they talking about? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah. The manna. Now, boy, if there's anything that the manna was not, it was not worthless. It sustained them miraculously. And the funny thing about the manna is that when you look into the original language here, it's actually described, and elsewhere in the scripture, I don't know the reference, but anyway, it's there somewhere um, in the Bible. It's talked about as angel's food. And when you dig deeper into the Hebrew, it, it comes out as the food for champions. Wow, interesting. For breakfast. Wheaties was the food for champions. But anyway, so the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and many of the people of Israel died. Hmm. Next verse. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, 
we have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And so Moses prayed for the people. But the next verse tells us that the prayer wasn't answered the way the people had hoped. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. When he looks at it. When he looks at it. So Moses made a bronze servant, serpent, put it on a pole, and so it was if a per serpent had bitten anyone when he looked. You see anyone? Anyone? When he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Wow. And so I don't know whether you've seen pictures like this before. This is an artistic representation of a serpent on a pole. And I guess you can immediately see the, 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 the parallel here with the cross. But why a serpent on the cross, not uh, an innocent lamb, which we see in other imagery and, 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 and comparisons that are made when Abraham had to take up um, his son Isaac, you know, and, and the sacrifice, and then God provided this, this ram caught in the thicket. Well, uh, it's, it's kind of strange, but in modern times, funnily enough, the medical symbol, if you look on the screen here, that is used today for healing and in medicine is the serpent on a pole. Interesting. You want to say something? Yeah. yeah. Actually, I was so excited when I went to nursing school and I kind of realized that that was a symbol. And I was like, wow, this is kind of depicting the Lord. But it's not just the stone that... Yeah. What had happened is they actually attributed to Greek mythology. Yes. And they call it the rod of Aeschylus. But um, it's actually the origin. Because if you look at any mythology, Greek mythology, Roman mythology, um, um, kind of tribal mythology, it tells the story of a flood. Mm -hmm. So there are. Creation. Yeah. Flood. Creation, flood. So the essential truth. That the enemy was trying to blur as taking away from God. Obscure, actually, yeah. Actually, yeah. it was the Lord. This is a symbol Originally. of what Absolutely. happened. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and, and funnily enough, in, a, in my summation, when we get to the end, you'll see some of this there uh, depicted and so it's with some scripture attached. Anyway, the people became <laughs> discouraged and began to murmur. Hmm. Despite God's miraculous provision of food, and water and the covering you know the, the pillar of fire by uh, night and the cloud by day they had heating they had air conditioning because you know deserts it gets very hot during the day and then very cold at night and and this went on for years upon years upon years and after a while I don't know I was thinking a little bit about it didn't want to go too far down that road but in you know in the church and maybe even in our own personal walk we sometimes get discouraged by things not happening according to the timetable that we want them to happen, right? You can think of your own examples there. And we start to complain, you know, why am I living in this house? And why am I driving this car and everything? Well, the fact that you've got a car, you've got a house, you've got food in your tummy, that, you know, <laughs> there's no one, no one blowing up the streets here and gangs roaming around, for example. Boy, we are blessed. And we start to murmur and complain. Well, these guys were blessed. There was a purpose. They were transitioning from here, slavery, to the promised land over there. But this in-between in period where things went a little bit haywire when they rebelled and they wouldn't go in and everything. And so that generation of unbelief had to flush out. And Well, that's the context. It's not because God is withholding any good thing from those who were walking uprightly before him. It's not God who's the fault here in anything ever. Then... And today, hallelujah, that's good news, right? So the serpents, now let's start to dig a little bit into the Hebrew here. When you take the word serpents in the Hebrew, the word is nachash, which means poisoner. As a serpent, we know with the poison fangs and it gives you poison. And some poison is something that takes what is good, introduces an element to it, and then it starts to dissipate and destroy. It's, it's not a good thing to, to have a poisoner. Look at Ecclesiastes. Uh, chapter 10 verse 8 he who digs a pit will fall into it and whoever breaks through a wall will be bitten by a serpent so you might think of a wall or a hedge or a barrier 
that is put there so that serpents can't get in. And if you break through it and you put your hand into it, you could probably get bitten in the natural. But if you apply this spiritually, if you break down the hedge of protection that God has over you because you now start to murmur and you become discouraged and you start to blame leadership and you start to blame God and everything like that, you open the door for the serpent to come through this hedge of protection around you. And that's really what's going on in verse 6 here, where when we go back to the scripture where it says, and God sent fiery serpents amongst the people. It looks like God is in cahoots with the devil, sending a punishment on, on the people there and to teach them a lesson to shape up or ship out. But rather in the Hebrew language, the, 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 the um, tense is more in the permissive tense that God permitted these serpents then to come out of where they were all, all around already in the desert and bite these people. It was the permissive tense rather than the causative tense in that verse 6 when you go back and you check it out there. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm moving quite quickly through this sort of thing, but I believe it has to do with the hedge of protection in this whole thing. And so really when you summarize it, you have to guard your heart, and that's the key here. Guarding your heart against complaining and murmuring about your life, no matter how hard it is, because there were serpents biting, and there were things going on here, and that's not cool. But if we guard our hearts, then that's a good thing. Amen? A lot of people say, well, we need to guard our finances, and we need to guard this, and we need to guard that. But really, the, the, the key to life is your heart connected to God, and then He leads you into how, how to live life and, 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 and do right in this life. And so, when we go on now, and we look at the people's request, remember they requested that Moses take these serpents away. They really wanted relief, but they didn't get to the heart of the issue. The heart of the issue was their heart of complaint and murmuring. It wasn't the snakes, because the snakes were always there. Now there was this hedge of protection that had been broken down through their unbelief and their murmuring and everything like this and the enemy got maybe an upper hand in this whole thing and started to bite them they wanted relief but god's solution was to command moses to make a bronze serpent on a pole and look at this thing come on now look at it how's it going to help can't you just give us a stick or something you know can't you give us a each of us the a flaming sword and or a stick that whenever a serpent comes out of the out of the brush or anything like this we just go like this and deal with the matter and very often in our christian walk we, we're looking for some kind of magical uh, thing to do lord just show me what i must do and this problem is going to go away well the lesson that we learn from this and Jesus and many others, like Daniel in the lion's den, is that problems, this side of the new heaven and the new earth, will always be there. Where you've got people, you've got problems, present company excluded, right? <laughs> present company excluded. And the people that didn't come tonight. Right? And the people sitting at the back by faith, right? <laughs> we want problems to be removed. But God wants us to learn how to live in the midst of problems, cocooned by his gracious provision and protection, surrounded by his favor, hedged in by his anointing, that nothing can touch our hearts. Nothing can touch our hearts. Nothing can impact our souls and our emotions and our feelings and all that sort of stuff. My, 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 my. Wow. Wow. Look at this thing. So why don't we dig a little bit deeper here? Let's keep drilling. And here we've got a picture of, you know, these mine shaft heads. Are you familiar with these things? We were very familiar with them in South Africa because what they did is that they would um, have all these cables, these long cables, and they would go down the shaft. There, and this, this shaft here would go down literally, in the cases of some of the gold mines there, um, up to a mile and a half straight down. Amazing, digging for the gold. They started finding gold on the surface, little pebbles and little, little nuggets and things like that. But if they really wanted to get all this rich ore down there that was just went on forever and made South Africa very, uh, a very wealthy nation through the 
uh, gold, um, you had to go dig deeper. And it's much like this in the Word of God. There's things that you can get cursorily that really bless your socks off. Mm -hmm. But then as you dig deeper, and as you start to connect the dots between the Old and the New Testament, and this writer and that writer and everything like that, whew, boy, stuff just starts to come out. It just the Bible is exciting. Anyone who says the Bible is boring and irrelevant for the 21st century hasn't even woken up yet. So, number one, to look. Remember Moses said, look at the serpent now. You don't have to do anything else, just look at it. To look in the Hebrew is nabat, which is to gaze intently with expectancy. Not just, oh yeah, I was looking outside and it's nice and sunny today. No, you gaze intently at something and then there's a change that comes comes about. Very interesting here. Now, but to change, to look intently. And this was God's provision. Um, if we, just, I just want to make this point. It was God's provision in the midst of danger, being hedged in or shielded from. And like I said earlier on with Daniel in the lion's den, he could have prayed a prayer, Lord, please send an angel to just go like this with his fingers, pluck me out of the lion's den, and put me in a Hotel 6 for the night. No, the prayer wasn't answered that way. The prayer was answered, go to sleep, just rest, I've got it under control, and all of these lions just kind of walked around. Him. He was in the midst of a hugely dangerous situation, and yet cocooned and protected. And so when we walk about, you know, because John was talking earlier on about, um, uh, uh, you know, the... Uh, the bombing in London, thing like that, and what to say to the grandkids if you go and watch the football at, at, at Seattle Seahawks or something like that, or the sound of soccer and everything like that. Boy, you and I live in a world where we better believe that God has commissioned angels to encamp around us to keep us in all our ways. Amen. Because our daughter lives in New York, and there was some nut job who drove down the sidewalk and slew through a whole lot of people on the sidewalk in Times Square. They, my daughter's been to Times Square. You and I have been to downtown, uh, what's that place uh, you know, where the coffee is? Uh, Pikes Market. Don't you think some nut job would like to pick on all the people there at Pikes Market and blow himself up in front of things and just rock Seattle's boat there? But in the name of Jesus, we bind that sort of stuff. Amen? And we trust God to be in the right place at the right time in the midst of of a dangerous world. Okay, so moving right along here. Why a bronze serpent now? What is this business of bronze? Couldn't it have been silver or some other cheap metal, copper or tin or whatever? Bronze. Well, bronze speaks of, in the Bible, when you let the Bible interpret the Bible, of judgment. And really, when, when you look at it theologically, it speaks of Jesus being judged on our behalf. Because I'm starting to paint the picture that Jesus is the serpent on the cross. Jesus is the serpent on the cross. He was judged on our behalf. Wow. And he, the, the, the consequences of sin and the fall, death, sickness, disease, strife, murders, wars, famines, all of those consequences were taken upon the sin bearer, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Now, as I said earlier on, God did not give each of those persons in the, in the, the people in Israel in that time, back in the day there, a stick to beat off the snakes. But an instruction to see with the eye of faith what he was trying to tell them. He wanted to protect them in that day. He wanted that day to point to Jesus' day and Jesus' day to reach into our day 20, 21 centuries later so when we all look to that moment in time and space in Jerusalem on Mount Calvary Jesus on the cross sucking in all of the sin all of the sickness all of the drama of life upon himself when you look at him what do you see? you don't see an innocent lamb you see all the nastiness of it. His face was marred more than any other man. He was beaten to a pulp. His face was bruised and misshapen. His beard was plucked out, probably trickling blood from it. His back was just a shredded mess. 
his hands, his feet, his side, sweat, spittle from a legion of soldiers. Jesus wasn't looking cool on the cross. He looked like a terrible sight because of our sin. Wow. So, you know, when we talk about change and transformation, uh, this comes when we behold God's glory. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, to take uh, this point from that context. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in the mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. What's the key operative verb in that passage? It's beholding. You see that there? Beholding. Do we have to pray longer? Fast longer? Uh, do Christian gymnastics to earn something from God? No, we have to behold and look. Fascinating. Let's dig a little bit deeper. When we go back to the word Nechash now, remember it's serpent. In the ancient Hebrew, modern Hebrew is somewhat different, but ancient Hebrew had pictographs. Those of you who did the Discovery series will know. Pictographs are these pictorial uh, depictions that summarized life and experience. And when you take the word Nechash, reading from right to left in Hebrew. So, you know, don't worry about, you're not going to be tested on this. Just relax, just receive. Okay. When you read from right to left, starting at Nun, see there, Nun, the pictograph for Nun, the Hebrew letter Nun, is a fish, which speaks of a believer. Historically, it speaks of a believer. The middle word there is, uh, letter is Chet. The word for Nakash is made up of three. One, two, three. Three is Chet, and if I pronounce it wrong, please forgive me. I'm just an English speaker from South Africa. It actually speaks of a fence or a hedge, kind of a connection between you over here and something over there. And then Shin actually has to do with the word El Shaddai, which is the name of God, the Almighty God, the Savior, the Deliverer, anything that you need God to be, the God. So the believer. If the serpent gets into the act, discourages you, causes you to murmur and depart from this childlike faith as a believer, puts up a hedge, he cuts off God's provision to you here, and you become exposed to the enemy, and you get bitten by the snake. You can look at it from a, a real point of view, as is in the story here, which I believe is a real story. It's not a me metaphorical thing, but it has metaphorical elements to it that in our Christian walk, that we as believers now, if we allow the work of the serpent to obscure or hedge us from seeing and beholding all that God has done and provided for us, well, then we won't enjoy his benefits and we'll come under the power of the enemy, even as Christians. We might believe certain things as Christians and go to heaven, but on the way there, boy, we experience all sorts of things. And so you'll see in your notes now, um, and also on the screen, yes, we do have it there, and I just want to show you. Let's take Nun. Nun is over, where is Nun? Someone help me. There's Nun. Sea, fish, activity, life. There's various meanings there, but we extract out of it the fish, the believing side of it. Uh, uh, Shin over here, eat, consume, I destroy. That's the almighty power of God. He can eat and consume and destroy evil if he wants to, and he does. And then what's the other one? Shet or Shet is this fence or tent wall or a wall of separation or a hedge of separation. When you put it all together, you get what I've just been sharing with you. If you look over here in terms of the Greek now, just to jump into the Greek and, and explain a little bit more about the fish. How many of you know the fish symbol? The fish symbol on the back of cars and everything like that. They used it in the early days. They, the first letters of the Greek words there, Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. It was a kind of a secret code. It's like a handshake kind of thing back in the day there that Christians used. And it has its roots all the way back into the Old Testament. And today we have people driving around in, the, in, in cars with the whole thing there. 
it's fascinating to see how, how it all fits in. And you can see there's another chart there, which I haven't got on the screen, that gives uh, uh, variations of what the um, Hebrew letters actually look like when you scribe them. Can you see that the bottom of page six in your notes? The bottom of page six in your notes, you can see how they look. The pictographs is the more ancient thing, whereas the, the bottom chart is how it's actually written in the Hebrew with the way they write it. Okay? That's what it looks like. Hmm. And that's about all the Hebrew that I know. <laughs> okay, so moving right along here. Number five, the word for bronze or judgment, funnily enough, because we've got the bronze serpent now, we've been looking at serpent, now we look at bronze for judgment, is a combination of words. And when you look at that combination, you've got the word tav. And you remember Aleph Tav from the Discovery series. If you don't, you can go back to your notes and go on the website and everything like that. But Tav, if you go back to the chart once again, the word, the, 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 let's go back there to the chart. Why not? Let's go back, 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 there. Tav at the bottom. See there? Tav. A mark or sign of the covenant and it actually looked like a cross. It's fascinating. It's not a, I mean, that was before the Romans even invented uh, crucifixion. It was, it was already embedded in, in the Hebrew language there. It's amazing. So let's get back to where we were, looking at bronze judgment, where you've got Tav, the cross, put together with Nun, Shet, Shin, which is the serpent. When you put that together there, you get bronze. Speaking of, just to summarize it, so don't get confused and just so where I can't connect the dots here. Just to summarize it, the serpent has been judged on the cross. The serpent represents evil, sin, sickness, calamity, everything, taken upon Jesus. It's been judged on the cross. The bronze serpent. The bronze serpent. Wow. Number six, just moving right along at a pace here. When Jesus spoke to Nicodemus by night, I need to finish up now, um, he spoke about this Moses moment. This is what he said to him. He said to Nicodemus, trying to explain who he, Jesus, was and what his ministry was. He says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man, a reference to himself, be lifted up. So he's, he's commenting and giving us a clue that he, Jesus, out of his own mouth is saying, I'm the serpent on the cross. I'm going to take all the judgment and set you free from that judgment. Why? Because I love you. Because of my grace gift. We see from verse 15 and 16 that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, blah, 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 blah. It's in that context. This verse 14 is just before John 3.16. It's because of God's love that he did all this. Wow. And then later on in chapter 4, Jesus himself, this is point number 7 now, emphasizes the whole business of seeing and beholding. He says in John, so it's John chapter 6, verse 40, And this is the will of him who sent me, the Father, that everyone who, see that there, sees the Son, believes in him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. It's just seeing. It's like that Muslim man that the God Todd White prayed for in the first session. He saw the glory of God. Now it's up to him to believe and go and do what he needs to do. Who knows what happened to that guy as he walked on down there in his family and everything like that. Hopefully he does come to his senses, repent, accept Jesus, and do what he needs to do in following him. Wow. And then finally now, point number eight. Believers, you and I, in this context here today, are compared to eagles. Did you know, you, how many of you can think of a, an eagle scripture as it refers to believers? Anyone can think of one? Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. And what do eagles do? They eat snakes. <laughs> they pick them up and they drop them and then they eat them. They just knock the snot out of them and they eat them. Verse 31 of Isaiah 40, But those who wait upon the Lord... I'm just looking at it, just reading the Bible. Wow, look at this healing. Look at this. Look at this gift. Look at your majesty. Look at your mercy. 
Look at your kindness. Look at your patience. Just look, look, look. What happens? When you wait upon the Lord, your strength is renewed. But if you try to take matters in your own hand, and you fret over things, and you stress over things, and you try and find for that stick that you can beat people over the head with, it just doesn't seem to work out too well. These people, believers, shall mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. What a glorious picture we have of what Jesus did for us. You see that picture there on the screen? Look at that. Look at the scriptures. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted. There's Jesus. There's the serpent. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And there, I think this is what you were talking about, um, Aeschylus, or what do you call it? The ro the ro Rod of, Rod of Aeschylus. Aeschylus, or however you pronounce that thing. Yeah. It's a pagan god of healing, which is a counterfeit and a perversion and a twisting of the original truth in the pagan community, the original truth in the Hebrew community, and then the same here with, I think, the Greeks here, uh, Mercury. Yeah, I think is it, it might be is Roman. a Roman, a Roman god, Mercury? That's what they say. When anyway, I mean, they're, they're both counterfeits there. Yeah. Okay. And the Nehushtan, or the Nahash, or the snake on a pole, and we've looked at those references, or the one reference in, in uh, Numbers. Okay, just to conclude quickly, right now, as we plumb the depths of God's Word, let's bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, and heals all your diseases. Hallelujah. And I like this picture of Jesus who's just looking down on us. I just feel that he's doing that right now. He's looking down on us and he's saying he's pleased with our faith. For without faith it's impossible to please me. But with the faith that you have, no matter how small, no matter how big, no matter how weak it sometimes feels to you, Know that the faith that you have, that you exercise, is pleasing to me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Bless you and worship you. In Jesus' name. Won't you just come up here and let's pray over these prayer requests. We turn our hearts and fix our